Don't tell me that the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Welcome to Shining Moon, a speculative fiction podcast, episode six. I'm your host, Deborah L. Davitt. Today, we'll continue our series by asking questions about translation and writing in English as your second language. Again, like last episode, we'll find out about how difficult it is to write in your second or third or fourth language, what the advantages of writing another language are, how you deal with reader expectations, and how to go about getting reputable translations for your work, which, as I mentioned last time, can be a thing. My guests today are Cecile Cristofari, Yelena Donato, and Floris Kleinje. Let's start with some introductions. Cecile Cristofari lives in South France, where she teaches literature and writes stories when her children are asleep. Good idea. Her fiction has appeared in Interzone, Daily Science Fiction, Reckoning, and others, and has been long listed for the BSFA Award. Her short story collection, Elephants in Bloom, is forthcoming from Newcon Press. Yelena Donato is an art historian, curator, speculative fiction writer, and lover of all things ancient. She grew up in Croatia on a steady steady diet of adventure novels and then wandered the world for a decade, building a career in the arts. Yelena's stories have been published in Beneath the Skies, The Dark, Future Sci-Fi, and Mermaids Monthly, among others. Her debut novel, Dark Woods, Deep Water, is coming out on September 19th from Ghost Orchard Press. She is a member of SWFA and Codex. Yelena lives on an island in the Adriatic with her husband, daughter, and cat. Hello, Yelena. How are you doing today? Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm great. It's gl- lo- lovely to have you on. And thank finally, you. We have Flo- finally, we have Floris M. Kleina, who juggles two writing careers while paying the bills with an unrelated day job. In English, she's the author of some 50 speculative fiction stories, some of them award-winning. In Dutch, and without the middle initial, he's an acclaimed thriller writer. In between, he translates. You can find him on Facebook at Floris Kleine or at his website, www.floriskleine.com. Hi, Floris. How are you today? Hey, hi, Deborah. Great to be on the show. Thanks. Right. So we're going to go ahead and dig right into this. Uh, we did an episode last time on, with Alex Schwartzman and Anatoly uh, Belilovsky talking about similar topics, but I know that some of you do self-translation, which is an entirely different skill set than translating other people's work. And I'm going to start with sort of picking on Floris here a little bit, because I know that you do this. How difficult is it to translate yourself? Well, the interesting thing is that it's... In my experience, much easier to translate myself than to translate others. I've then done some commercial business translation as well, and then it's translating to order, starting from a text that someone else has, someone else has created, which, in my feeling, in my experience, limits uh, the freedom. And translating my yeah. own work, it was very easy to make choices that fit the story better in the in the, other, the second language. I have mostly translated from English to my native Dutch. And I could take great liberties with the text and with the style and with the tone of voice and even mm-hmm. with settings and, and, and backgrounds that fit better in the Dutch version than the English version. So uh, it went very smoothly. I could basically rewrite the story in, in Dutch from the English original instead of really sticking closely to the original uh, text. What was expressed last night when we were doing the doing the episode was how much do you betray the author? And apparently, you betrayed yourself liberally. I betrayed myself liberally, very much so. But sometimes you do you can't do anything else because, uh, for example, my my time travel story, what which won the Rise of the Future, meeting the sculptor, in the original. Uh, the story requires a moment when somebody travels back in time and recognizes a very important historical moment. 
And for the original, I took the Gettysburg Address because we know that you have to quote like 12 words and everybody knows what it is. And mm-hmm. then when I went to Dutch and nobody, but I, but I mean, nobody in Holland knows the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> so the hardest part of that translation was finding a kind of similarly recognizable historical event in uh, Holland. And because we're not very patriotic here, there's not much to go on. <laughs> so on one hand, it was a difficult search. On the other hand, I could take this liberty because it was my story. So I could toss out an entire scene and write another one which better fit my uh, local audience. All right. That brings up cultural translation and trying to find things that are uh, appropriate or understandable for one audience to another and how many times you wind up having to use footnotes and how many times you try to avoid using footnotes to convey information that might or might not be readily available to your new audience. And I know, Cecile, I know that you do translations as well out of French. How do you wind up dealing with this? Um, with cultural translations, uh, well, it's really it's on a case by case basis. Um, for example, if there is uh, wordplay, sometimes you can translate it if you're lucky, especially with English and French, since there is so much vocabulary in common. Very often, you can make it work. Every so often, you just have to think, for example, okay. These characters are obviously engaged in some kind of banter. So I'm just going to try to choose what to keep. Mm -hmm. For example, let's say I just want to keep the tone. They are, well, there's this banter going on. Maybe they're making jokes or playing on words here and there. So maybe I'm going to reach for a place where I could insert a similar joke or wordplay. And it's going to lose the original, but the tone on the whole is going to, um, I'm going to keep that. Um, And when it comes to references, honestly, usually I prefer to keep the original reference Mm -hmm. and just trust the readers to figure it out. Um, In some cases, for example, this doesn't really apply to translation, but when I write my own stories, I tend to write stories that uh, take place in, uh, well, in South France and very often on the coast, on the French Riviera. Uh, Mm -hmm. And when I describe the landscape, usually uh, I change a couple of details. For example, uh, there are lots of, um, on the French Riviera, a very characteristic plant is the agave. Mm -hmm. Because it's been produced there and it's very, well, it looks very spectacular. Except that if you write uh, that there are agaves all over the place, I think that many readers, especially in North America, are going to assume that this is uh, taking place in Mexico Mm -hmm. or in the the southern US. So instead, usually I switch, I say, I mention pines or aloes. Even though aloes and agaves are different plants, but just to keep in mind that readers uh, may have different expectations and aloes may speak of the Mediterranean a bit more. And yeah, so that's the sort of thing you wind up doing. It's really on a case by case basis how our readers are going how readers are going to understand a specific phrase or words, are the connotations different between a language and another? Um, yeah, there's no universal solution, really. Yelena, when you're Mm. writing for yourself, do you find that you have to make similar accommodations for your audience when you set something in the Adriatic or something like that? Yes, I I definitely do. I mean, um, for example, um, it's, it's much easier if you are translating or even writing from from one big culture to another. For example, with with Cecile, it's from French to to, uh, American or or English. So you have big cultures who will probably understand each other's references, whereas um, I come from a very small culture and a small language. 
And so if, if I'm writing from a creation standpoint, then I, I always have to think about cultural references and I always have to worry about, you know, including things into my text in the way that um, my readers will, will, will understand them. But also, you know, uh, finding a balance between uh, info dumping or explaining too much and on the other hand, uh, uh, avoiding uh, using your own culture as an embellishment, as an as an ornament, you know, just just to make it more diverse or or more interesting or exotic. I hate that word, but people use it. So yeah. there's there's always this, you know, and I'm I'm sure that you know, for example, in my stories and and uh, in my books, there there are cultural references which I'm sure many readers won't even pick up, and I am completely fine with that. Um, I think that my task is that um, this lack of knowledge on their side um, doesn't make the rest of the story uh, obscure for them. So um, to, to those who see the cultural references, that will be an interesting detail. And for those who don't, I just hope there will be like interesting details that enhance the immersion into text, basically. So there is, there is this balance I'm, I'm always trying to find. Would you say that there is an educative uh, tendency in, when you are trying to include your culture? Do you want, do you want to, people to learn a little bit about Croatia and Croatian? Um, obviously, yes, because, you know, otherwise I, otherwise I wouldn't be writing uh, stories and, and books set in Croatia and, and using, you know, Slavic and Croatian mythology and history. So. Obviously, there, there oh, that's is. that's lovely. <laughs> there, there is, you know, uh, uh, well, I won't say need, but a tendency to, to, you know, introduce people to something new. But also, I am very aware of the fact that, you know, even, even when readers say that they want something new or something different, uh, it can't be too new or too different. So you always have to adapt in a way. Yeah, understood. Floris, when you are writing from a Dutch perspective, how much uh, finagling do you have to do to get your culture across? Is, do you uh, find that there's a barrier or do you find that it's easy? Well, the, the, the way I, I started using my own cultural background and, 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 and country in my fiction was that I was basically I switched to English uh, writing uh, to get access to the market because there's no market in, in Holland. So uh, English was my way uh, way into publication, and my first re re reflex was to actually transfer all my stories to a, an American setting. So I've hmm. written stories take place in Manhattan and uh, and uh, places uh, that I'm not at all familiar with. God bless Google Street View. Um, I do the same thing if it helps at yeah. all because I will sit yeah. there and I will zoom in exactly. on Google Street View and go. This is a place I have never been in my life, but I can make it authentic as hell by just saying that there's a water tower at the, at the corner of 7th and exactly. Main. Oh, I, 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 it's totally out of scope of this conversation, but I should tell you guys some, at some point about how my editor turned out to live somewhere. No, never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was kind of trying to make my stories uh, culturally aligned with my target audience. And at some point, an editor said, but wait, you're from Holland. Why don't you use your background? And I said, oh, that, that one could be kind of cool. So I got, basically, <laughs> I'd written a story taking place in Seattle. I'd been to Seattle for the first change. And they said, well, you're European, you're Dutch, go, go, go on, put it there. And so I, I rewrote it to Rotterdam, which is like uh, uh, 60 miles from my home. And it was like a, a great experience to like be able to use something I know very well. And I really didn't mm -hmm. bother with um, bringing it across with more effort than I did before. Like Cecile and uh, Jelena Alabes both say, is uh, if the reader wants to know more, there's Google. And mm -hmm. there's Google Maps and there's, there's all kinds of sources. But I believe that the background, the cultural background of the story and the setting of the story should be should serve, serve the story. But not, I'm not at all uh, inclined to... to be edu educational about it. Okay. I want to bring my story across, not my, not not teach my readers about my country, not at all. Okay. So I just Fair I enough. use I use the setting, I use the background, and if you learn something from it, great. And if you don't, 
thanks for enjoying my story. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, speaking of editors, how do you deal with an editor who wants to change your authorial voice? Uh, because this is something that happens periodically where they want to change your word choice, your diction, your, your, your tone. Uh, this, this happens to all authors, but I imagine that there are certain pitfalls for people who are coming out of a different language just to begin with. And I'll start with Cecile this time. Do you, have you ever encountered this as a problem or have editors been more willing to get, give you latitude and understand that you do come from a different place? Oh, well, actually, it's never been a problem because uh, so far I've been lucky. I've dealt with very understanding editors and uh, they were willing to discuss word choices and things like that. And I mean, the fact is, I'm not a native English speaker. So if someone tells me that, for example, I used the wrong preposition somewhere, prepositions mm -hmm. in English for the record, they are hell. I don't know <laughs> who came up with that idea. They are absolute hell. <laughs> so I, I still make mistakes and they are legitimate mistakes, not word choices. So, well, I'm pretty grateful to have editors pick on that uh, and you know, help improve my stories. That being said, um, it's something I have noticed in the past, but people tend to have different reactions to my uh, writing when mm -hmm. they know I'm not a native speaker. Like if they yeah. don't know, if it's completely anonymous, usually they end up assuming I'm British because I use mm -hmm. British spellings. And that's apparently the most salient thing about my writing. If they know I'm French, they are going to be more inclined to correct the grammar, things like that. But so far with editors, it's always been a positive experience because when it came to actual stylistic choices, um, now they never, I, I've never been asked to change something I had deliberately put there. And if it's just a comma or a preposition, you know, I mean, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but yes, with, with readers, though, the experience has been at times a bit stranger like i remember this one reader who said your grammar is wrong and can i have okay. an example wow. of something to fix and i would not have anything specific in mind but you could just read trunk and white it's all in there all right exactly, yeah well thank you <laughs> um thanks goodbye. loads <laughs> well, th th yeah. th that that has happened to me, and I'm a native speaker of English, and th I've, I've had mm -hmm. I've had readers go, uh, "You meant you obviously meant refugees, and you put down refuges." I'm like, "No, I meant refuges." <laughs> Thank you very much, because uh, all these characters are taking refuge in something. They're not refugees. There's a, it's a completely different use of the uh, uh, very similar, yes. very similar word. Yeah. But they, I really did mean what I said. I meant. Yeah. So it, 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 it can happen to anybody. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I recognize um, what you say, Cecile, because that's uh, uh, it's more a prejudicial thing than a language thing, I think. I, I mean, the, the one thing that, that uh, one time that happened to me was when I, I was on Critter, Critters, when it still existed. Does it still exist? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I well, think it I, does. I, I, I did a, a brief foray into in Critter territory. And uh, I submitted the story for critique, and one of the critiques I got back was, "Well, uh, my young man, you have a lot to learn." It was very condescending. Uh, oh, you have lovely. a lot to learn. It's not your native language, and blah blah blah. All of that. And all the examples he pointed out was just authorial voice or style or characters saying things. Uh, so, oh, lovely. So I came back with, "Well, uh, this was actually when I had uh, already had two uh, stories in the Rise of the Future anthologies." So I kind of snarkily came back to him and said, well, uh, this, these are my credits. Could it be about style? And then he, well, he shut up. But this was because, <laughs> because he knew I was a non-native speaker European. And I'm pretty sure that if I had been uh, English or I'd fake being English, um, he wouldn't have responded like that. And uh, so far, in my experience, editors, editors haven't noticed. 
at all. Oh, I have definitely had I have definitely had a, a British copy editor come after me for word choice, and I was just went uh, I, I went back up to the main editor and said, "Look, I'm American. Uh, we we do use the language differently. Do you, if you if you want me to rewrite the entire story into British English, that's that's not going to happen. I will withdraw the story." Uh, and he said, no, 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 we're not asking you to do that. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's a whole thing, even inside of English, one, one continent yeah. to another. Yelena, have you encountered anything like this? Well, uh, I've, I've worked with great editors, so I, I, I don't have any bad experience. What, what I don't like, and it's, it's getting rarer now is italicizing the uh, foreign words. This, this is one thing that I, that I don't like. For example, if, if you, I, I, I use a lot of Italian in, in my stories for some reason because they're usually set in Italy, uh, and, although I'm Croatian. <laughs> but uh, sometimes I will use, I will use uh, Italian words and uh, editors will italicize them, and I, I don't like that. Um, and there's also something that I've noticed which might not be, um, you know, um, a stylistic or editorial thing, but it does happen sometimes, and that's the, the tone of stories. And I've noticed with um, American editors and, and American magazines that they tend to uh, prefer more uplifting or uh, a more, uh, how should I say it, less ambiguous stories. Um, I, this is my personal mm. experience. I might be completely wrong here because there are some very dark magazines in in the in the u.s but still like uh, i i see this general tendency of you know um um rejecting stories which are um sad or ambiguous or um melancholic and that might be that might just be the type guys that that might not be you know editorial thing but it's just something that i've noticed hmm interesting yeah all right, so let's shift slightly and talk about uh, not so much grammar pitfalls, but do you find that you unconsciously mirror the grammar structure of your native language when you're speaking or writing in English? Is that something that is a struggle for you, or do you find that it, it, it is you, you're just so proficient in English that you're able to avoid that? No, it, it, it does happen. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's more of a positive thing. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the grammar, it's the rhythm of the language. Mm -hmm. um, like, so in English, especially, well, in poetry, um, mm -hmm. classical, po classic English poetry is in iambic pentameters, right? I am, mm -hmm. so it's yes. a binary rhythm. Very often, ternary rhythms are, well, they exist, but they are less common. In French, it would be the opposite. We mm -hmm. tend to use a ternary rhythm. So when I write, every so often, I want to write a sentence that sounds nice to me. And mm -hmm. I'm going to fall back into that ternary rhythm. To me, it sounds much more musical, much more pleasing. But that's probably because of my native language. And But actually, I, I like it. I mean, if it's something mm -hmm. I have that makes my prose perhaps a little bit different or something. I don't want to, this is not something I want to erase. I don't want to train myself to do iambic pentameters or whatever. Well, I'm not good at poetry anyway, but... Um, no, yeah, the iambic pentameters... I think there is this uh, natural rhythm to the language uh, mm -hmm. outside of drama. You know what I mean? Uh, and... Yes, I think even when I speak or write in English, it's the rhythm of French that tends to come out very often. Well, I think that your prose sings. So when, everything I've read of yours has sung. So I, I, I love the rhythm of your, of, in the Thank cadence you. of your writing. So keep, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Be you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, but How yeah, when it comes to... Sorry. No, no, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you had more, by all means, go. Oh, you know, I was just going to talk about drama a little bit, but um, yeah, no drama, not so much. And vocabulary, the interesting thing between English and French is that there is so much in common, but a lot of words have changed meanings in oh yes one language or both, 
And so every so often, I tend to use, I'm going to use a word that is reasonably common in French. And it's very, it turns out to be very common in English. And so I've had readers say, okay, I had to look up that word, um, but it, it exists. <laughs> I had to look it up. That's, and I just say, well, okay, fine. So people are just going to think I speak absolutely perfect, excellent English, when in fact I'm just <laughs> speaking halfway between English and French. Uh, and yeah, sometimes it, well, sometimes I do miss the mark. Like you, I use a word because I'm absolutely convinced that it has the same meaning in English and in French. And in fact, the word exists in English, but has a completely different meaning. So my sentences can, can end up um, a bit strange, Co perhaps. Cognates are the bane of my existence. When I was taking Anglo-Saxon and I was translating Beowulf way back in college, uh, I ran into the word Brun, which in German means brown. And I, of course, mm. went, okay, it's, 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 it's a brown sword. It must have blood on it or something like that. And my professor very calmly took me aside and said, you can't rely on cognates. That actually means no. dark. It's a dark blade. And I went, oh, okay. But it, the, the, because I recognize so many cognates out of German in Anglo-Saxon, it was just reflexive to reach for the first word that I knew that something meant. So that 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 is a whole translation thing in and of exactly. itself i mean yeah. in some cases it can end up with surprising or interesting results so it's the same it's not really something i want to uh erase from the way i write i mean sometimes maybe i'm going to have to rewrite a sentence because i just plainly used the wrong word and sometimes it's going to end up with something i wasn't quite intending but yeah. that sounds good nonetheless. So, so yeah, I, th I think it's actually something you can use when you write. It's not just a, a handicap. It's something you no, can it's use. A, yeah, absolutely. Floris and Yelena, yeah. uh, the unconscious mirroring of grammar structures from your native language when you're writing in English. Do you, do you find this a superpower, the way Cecile does? Um, I, I don't do it at all, I, 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 <laughs> I think. I mean, I've not never been caught at it anyway. Uh, but, but there's something else that I found interesting about grammar structure and uh, and what uh, Cecile said about rhythm, because uh, well, I've I've written in both English and Dutch, and I've translated in both directions. Uh, and what I found is two uh, remarkable things about the difference between the languages. One is that uh, I love English because it has so, has so many more words for things. Mm. Which is a challenge when translating back to Dutch, um, <laughs> uh, and there's also a lot of freedom in uh, creating uh, compound and composite words on the fly, wi mm -hmm. without breaking the flow of the language, in which d Dutch doesn't have at all. They're rather cumbersome and uh, ugly and long and, and 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 unpronounceable compound words. So that's one aspect that's very remarkable, and which helps. Uh, when writing in English and really requires an adjustment when writing in Dutch. And I've also found that the, the, the rhythm and flow of the languages are entirely different. Yes. Uh, and I write for rhythm uh, as much as for, for, for content. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost literally, I write not just a story, but I also want it to be able to be read out loud and yes. smoothly. And any any good story has like a, a beat to it. There, mm -hmm. there are points at which you can end a paragraph or a chapter and points at which you can absolutely not end a paragraph or a chapter. And all those things are very different between the languages, which means that uh, the, mo the, the, the moment where I struggle most with the grammar and the gram grammar structure is when I'm translating from, from the one to the other, because mm -hmm. it requires like paragraph level restructuring to, to get yes. rhythm which also results in uh, an in inevitable huge difference in my authorial voice in Dutch or in English because the, the languages support different types of rhythm and different types of flow somehow. Yes. So, uh, and and uh, I've never had much trouble with the English uh, rhythm and flow and grammar, nor with Dutch because that's my native language. And, and English is basically 
the second language around us in this country. Like it's on TV, people, uh, including mm -hmm. myself, read a lot in English. Uh, music, TV shows. I mean, there's a lot of English around it. So picking up on this on the language is fairly easy, I would say. But adjusting to this difference in the two languages and switching between the two. I mean, I uh, my first novel, which came out in 2021, and my publisher asked me to translate because they knew I could do, to do both. They asked me to translate the first chapters to for the international market and for for the for sales. And I, I I had a, I mean, this novel in Dutch was pretty much uh, polished in terms of of rhythm and structure and style and 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 the beats of the chapters and the beats of the scenes. And I really had to work it to get get the same or an approximation of the same thing. In the English versions of the chapters, that was a very, very interesting challenge, more so than with short stories, even because, uh, well, length and the complexity of the structure at the novel level. So that's what my experience is that, uh, uh, especially in the transition between the two, there's the differences make make life difficult and interesting. Let's put it that way. All right. Yeah. Yelena, I, I think basically <clears throat> the floor is spot on here. Because, uh, and that's the reason why I hate translating my own stuff, because I, I never get the, the rhythm right. Um, basically, uh, Croatian and English are yeah. two very, very different languages with very different rules. Um, mm -hmm. And, for example, Croatian is a heavily inflected language, uh, which means that you can say mm -hmm. more with fewer words, <laughs> so um, which eliminates many uh, short, tiny little words that you have to use in English. Um, which which is um, which basically um, makes it less cluttered in a way. And you know, I'm I'm not trying to be you know uh, uh, derogative or anything. But it's for example in, in poetry, it comes very handy handy because you end up with shorter and yes. more elegant sentences in a way. So with with English, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's sometimes it's sometimes uh, more difficult because you simply need more words to say things, um, and also. Oh yes. Don't, 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 don't try Dutch then, because they need even more words in in, in Dutch. <laughs> um, and I mean, and also, I mean, there were there were some things there. There were some big differences in grammar. Um, I had to get used to uh, when using English. For example, um, I mean, there there are some very obvious things. For example, in Croatian, we don't have articles. We don't have definite or indefinite articles. We don't use them, so you don't need them. So I still like when mm -hmm. I when I use articles. Oh, I, <laughs> I still have to think about it. Like, oh, does this need an article? And for example, we we don't we don't see passive voice as something bad in writing in Croatian. You know, passive mm -hmm. is just a voice. Um, adverbs are just adverbs. Um, the sequence of tenses is not so strict. Uh, we don't have reported speech in in, in the same in the same way that the, the English does. So, I mean, the, the rules are very different. And basically, uh, when I write in English, or even when I translate, and that's why I hate translating myself, um, I have to start from scratch if I'm doing it. So, because nothing that I used uh, in a stylistic or rhythmical way will apply to, to English text. So you have to start, start anew. And it's especially difficult if you're trying to... Uh, to make your short story sing, or if you're trying to write poetry, mm -hmm. uh, in in those cases, I I almost never translate my own my own work. I, I I'd rather you know start writing from scratch than than trying to to translate and basically destroy uh, the piece. I think I think that's on the subject of poetry more, even more. In uh, in Flash, because I'm, I've trans tra translated my own work, but Flash is almost impossible because. In Flash, it's even more concentrated uh, mm. uh, words doing three jobs at once and rhythm and structure be being of the utmost importance, etc. So trans bringing yeah. that to a new language, I've, I've done it twice and I won't, don't want to do it again. It, it, <laughs> it hurts. And also, Painful. I was going to just uh, say... Uh... I was just going to say that on the terms of poetry, I, I, I haven't translated poetry, but I have used forms from other languages. And I can definitely tell you that English is not meant to go into, say, Irish forms. It is just mm. not meant to go into there. The, the, the language does not 
fold down very well into the Irish forms or the Welsh forms because mm. it just the, the the grammar and where the where the emphasis is is just so different and it, it's it's a challenge and I I love the challenge and I I relish trying to do it but it is extremely difficult so mm. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from on that. Mm. Oh, as a footnote, Jelena. By the way, I think we need, and, and Deborah, I think we need a separate podcast on why passive voice is not bad. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yes. <laughs> and also, and I didn't know what passive voice was until I hit college, and I had a college professor go through one of my papers saying passive voice, passive voice, passive voice, passive voice, and I was like, I didn't know this was a bad thing. The, the words convey the meaning that I was trying to get across. Why is this yeah. bad? And also, the, the, the verb yeah. to be is just an auxiliary verb. It has its meaning, and you know, it has its place. And I don't know why yes. you hate it so much, but you exactly. do. <laughs> yeah. How can I sadism is, be uh, bad uh, uh, to be not? <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be is a perfectly good sentence and shakespeare is famous mm -hmm. for having written it exactly there you go and his editor would have said uh, come on william can you use a different verb the next <laughs> yeah, make, make, make the words work for you uh -huh. you know don't just use the verb to be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. Um, dealing with readers, uh, when you're when you're reading, when you're doing a public reading of your work in English, do you find that readers are inclined to go along with you and give give you the acceptance that you're that you deserve and that you're due? Or conversely, if you have somebody else do the reading for you, say for a podcast or an audiobook, how do you deal with them as they sound out foreign to them words? Because I'm sure that is a whole thing. I, I have dealt, as I mentioned on the last podcast, I, I've, I've had a, a pot, something of mine podcasted and the, there was no back and forth. There was, there was no review by me to make sure that, that the right words were said. And they wound up sending out a text to the narrator that had bad, bad sentences in it that they were supposed to have been uh, edited out. And I had edited out. And so they, they instead had stubs and things like that in it. So that, that was painful to listen to for me. So how do you wind up dealing with narrators for podcasts and just reading in public as a whole? And I'm going to go back to Cecile since she hasn't had a chance to talk yet in a while. <laughs> Um, well, I haven't had a chance to do public reading yet. I'll let you know how that goes if I do mm -hmm. one. Okay. For podcasts, um, well, I had a brief exchange with the narrator um, about the pronunciation of, well, of proper nouns um, in particular. Um, I have to admit, it sounds strange to my ears when I hear someone read my stories in English and they pronounce mm -hmm. French nouns with a strong uh, English accent. I mean, obviously oh, it's not wrong, right? They're speaking in English. But to me, it sounds, it probably shows that I'm in a strange kind of uh, halfway space when I write, like I write in English, but most mm -hmm. of the time, I mean, in my daily life, I speak French with uh, my family, with my friends. So English is something I use when I write or with my students in class. Mm -hmm. So my brain functions mostly um, in French. But the thing is, it's also because I think proper nouns in many stories, they are the place where the culture really manifests itself, if that yes. makes sense. Um, like, I mean, it, it's a bit of a tangent, but also maybe not completely. You know that Tolkien, when he gave instructions to translators, when the mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings became really popular, uh, he gave explicit instructions to translators and said, well, since the names of the hobbits are all supposed to be translated from the hobbit language then you should translate those names into whatever language you're using. And so, for example, in French, uh, Bilbo Baggins is, has become Bilbon Saké. <laughs> and 
the big problem, I think that, I mean, I absolutely understand the intention and well, Tolkien was a language nerd, so I can forgive him anything, no problem. But the thing he hadn't taken into account was the fact that the hobbits, well, they are English. They look English. They sound English. Sound English. Yes. yes. They act like English people from the countryside. They do not sound like French people at all. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I suppose to me it sounds really strange because I'm from South France, so the difference is quite important, I suppose, to somebody from the north of France. I mean, why not? You know, rolling hills and uh, damp weather and it's a bit closer to, to the UK. But just imagine a Japanese translation of The Lord of the Rings with Japanese names. I mean, that wouldn't sound right. Or, you know, a Moroccan translation, a Spanish translation, whatever. That wouldn't sound right at all. So, um, I mean, I think it was reading The Lord of the Rings and just trying to change the names in my head when I read it because it sounded so horrendous, honestly. <laughs> to me, that, that wasn't right at all. And I think that's <laughs> one of the things that made me realize, it made me realize that when you use names, in the story, they're not just, um, they are actually extremely important. They're not just words. Uh, they carry a part of the culture, of the setting, and of yes. everything. So that's why I mean, I always wish, in a way, that when someone uh, reads my story, they would read the, the, the names with the French accent. I know that's not going to happen. It's not a big deal. But in my head, that's why it, it still matters a little bit. Oh, that, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make so very sure that I was getting everyone's names right today is because it, it's, it's a gesture of respect. Indeed. And <laughs> yes. Thank you. It's, it's my experience uh, with all, all podcast uh, uh, producers thus far that they always make a point of getting the name right, which I really appreciate a great deal. Uh, other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm about my name. I, I really like that to be pronounced as, as it should be. Other than that, I don't, I'm not very particular. I've, I've never met an English. I've you never met it? an English speaker who got my name right on the first attempt. So uh, it's. Um, I usually. I usually just. Hmm. just yeah. I usually just send them uh, a sound clips. Uh, you know, I just record the the, the correct pronunciation and mm-hmm. just send it to them because it. You know, it's it's, yes. it's difficult to explain everything and you know try to send them guides and everything. So um, I think that. Uh, my my most positive experience was with uh, BCS, um, and th- you know there's a there's a really wonderful recording of my story there, um, and I and there's a a, a lot of um, Italian obviously because it's set in Venice a lot of Italian names in that story and I just I just sent them uh, a recording of of myself reading those names and um, it it came out really wonderful. Nice. I was in a well, position done. where I was, I had uh, a story of mine recently recorded for Lightspeed, and they were asking me how to pronounce certain names which came out of Afghanistani tribal languages. And I'm like, your guess is as good as mine. I am not an expert <laughs> here, but here, here's where I think the, the syllables line up. Here's where I think the stresses are. Let's try it this way. And hopefully we don't offend anybody. Right. So do any of you have any recent projects that you'd like to talk about or anything new coming out soon? Well, I, I could talk about my new novel, but uh, for our audience sure. here, it's not very useful because it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm a, basically I'm, a, I'm an English language short story writer and a Dutch novelist. So uh, it's, it's a Dutch novel. Sorry. And I'm also I'm also been kind of unfaithful to our genre because uh, I'm a Dutch thriller writer. So uh, my next book is coming out in January. It's done. We have the proofs. We have the advanced review copies, and uh, it's coming out. I'm very excited about it. But nobody listening to this cares. That's sad. <laughs> you care. Well, you guys you might... care. I'm sure. I care. I do. Will you be will you be doing a trans will you be doing a translation of the first chapters again or is that something I'm you don't not, want to do again? Yeah, I'm a, a, the last time they actually paid me for it, and I'm hoping to get get them to do that again. So yeah, that's about that's the plan. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 
I do expect them to uh, to want to market it in an in, uh, 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 outsider country again as well. So yeah, I, I don't see why not. So I'll definitely share that. Thank you. Yeah. Cecile, yeah. do you have anything recent or anything new coming out or? Uh... Well, um, I have a short story collection that's going to be released by New Compress. So the exact date is, has not been specified, but uh, yeah, so I'm quite excited about this actually, because um, I write a lot about uh, the environment, the relationship between humans and the earth etc. And usually, well, I tend to be a bit chatty, especially when I'm right. <laughs> and um, like, I cannot possibly write flash. They always end up as 5,000 word stories after a couple of you months of revisions. Both. Yeah. So doing a collection, you know, <laughs> that was a great opportunity to put everything in there, everything I wanted to write, everything I wanted to say. And uh, yes, it's going to be mostly about um, the environment, um, a little bit of feminism, and with a lot of whales, because for some reason I write about whales uh, all the time. And um, yes, I also got to write notes for the stories, so that it's more of a, well, it's not just short stories stacked on top of each other. I try to think of this as a kind of long discourse. And Interesting. So I'm excited, as you can see. Yeah. Yes, it was a really, you, really good thing to work on. Could you repeat the title of the collection, please? So the title is Elephants in Bloom, and it's okay. going to be released by Newcom Press. All right. Okay. Oh, Yelena, oh, I, totally I think you've got read a novel that. I, I do. In, in a month's time, uh, on September the 19th, I have a, a, my debut novel in English. Um, I've already published one novel in Croatian, but that oh, yeah. doesn't count, as Floris said, because nobody's going to read that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, no, this, this, is, this one is called um, Dark Woods, Deep Water, and um, it will be published by Ghost Talking Press in, in the UK. Um, and it's a, it's a blend of, uh, of dark fantasy and, and gothic horror. Um, and it's a, it's a novel set, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a novel. Um, it's it's set in a, a secondary world, but it's it was influenced by the history of, of Eastern Adriatic, which is the, the place where I where I live, um, and uh, Slavic folklore. So I think it will be. I'm, I'm actually mm -hmm. very interested to see uh, how the readers will react to this one because it's um, it's written. It was written in English originally, so it's not a translation. But it's a translation of culture of sorts because I was I was writing about my own history and and my own culture and you know uh, my own mythology and and things like that. So it's um, in a way it's a strange mixture of you know something written in English language but uh, with themes from another culture. And I I am I am very I am very curious to see how how the readers will re respond to that. Sounds it's very, very good, yeah. by the way. I've read it and you Oh, you've already read it? <laughs> yes, I have, and it's excellent. So, yes. Oh. oh, wonderful. I want I want both of them on my nightstand. It sounds like a fantastic thing, set of things to read. I would love if you would send yeah. them to me. I'm, I'm, I'm drowning in stuff to read for the podcast anyways, but let's add more to the pile no if you problem. wouldn't mind. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you all for having been a part of this episode. It was a delight speaking with all of you. Next week on Shining Moon, we'll switch to subjects to the topic of writing role-playing games with special guest Erun Aviram of Crystal Hearts. See you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yay, it was great.